So for me, wild lettuce is anodyne because it is a nervine hypnotic. And what that means is that it is a sedative for the nervous system and in a stronger way. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I am super excited to bring you this interview with Seja Popham. I've known Seja for many years and have loved watching his school and herbal product lines develop over the years. And as you'll hear in this interview, Seja and I share a lot of similar views about, about the heart of herbalism. And you'll find he has some very unique ways of putting it all together. For those of you who don't know Seja already, he's the author of Evolutionary Herbalism and the founder of Natura Sophia Spagyrix and the School of Evolutionary Herbalism, where he trains herbalists in a holistic system of plant medicine that encompasses clinical Western herbalism, medical astrology, Ayurveda, and spagyric alchemy. Sage's focus is the development of a comprehensive approach to herbalism that balances the science and spirituality of people and plants. He believes in healing the whole person with the whole plant, that our body, psychology, and soul can be healed with the chemical, energetic, and spiritual properties of plants. Well, welcome to the show, Seja. I'm so thrilled to have you here. Finally. Feels like yeah. a fight. Oh, oh, I'm so honored to be a part of the show. Thanks for having me, Rosalie. It's good to good to see and chat with you again. Yeah, likewise. Um, do you remember how far back we go? I was trying to think of that today, but you know, it's like it keeps changing. So it's like yeah, at least well, a decade though. At least a decade. I mean, I think well, were you at the Northwest Herb Fair that Michael Polarski Skeeter put on? Like all those, because I remember that's where I met John Gallagher. That's I where I kind of met John Gallagher too. Okay, no. yeah, that was like the life changing herbal uh, fair for a lot of folks. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, there was there was that because we were kind of doing the West Coast Conference Circuit for a while. Yep. So there was that, and then I really remember you and Whitney from the Montana gathering many many years ago as well yes yes yeah. yeah some good ones out there in montana <laughs> yeah but i knew i must have known you for, before then because this is my memory we had been driving and driving and driving getting all the way to montana and i showed up at the conference and i was like had that like buzz of like you know the like i've been driving for too long buzz oh, yeah. and just like, i was just like <laughs> and I remember I knew you, like, I remember that. And I remember going to your booth and you had a lemon balm spagyric and you had the little testers out, you know? And so I walked over and put, you know, a drop or two on my hand and, you know, licked that off as herbalists do. Yeah. And it was, it was like, oh, I just felt like I'd like come back into my body finally. And so I have that very clear memory besides, you know, hanging out with you at that conference. Nice. Uh, that lemon balm spagyric essence is really profound. And just a few drops like that, too. It's like, wow, it works really fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I remember that. I will never forget that because I really did, you know, feel it. So, but obviously, you were an herbalist long before that. So I'd love to hear, you know, what got you into all of this? Yeah, well, boy, it sure isn't. It's kind of a crazy story, you know, I mean, because Ever since I was a little kid, I always wanted to be a doctor, you know, like, oh, like four or five, you know, I just, I wanted to be a doctor and, you know, throughout my childhood, <clears throat> kind of changed a little bit what kind of doctor I wanted to be. But, you know, when I was in high school, getting ready to go into college, I was like on track to be, you know, I was kind of tossed between either a neurosurgeon or a cardiovascular surgeon. And, um, and I was kind of 
on on that track to go to conventional medical school. And uh, I moved out and was just going to like whatever community college trying to get some uh, local residency in California. And um, and I ended up my it's actually my stepmom bought me this book about herbs and healing. And it was kind of like, I don't even know what, what book it is <laughs> anymore. But and I remember getting really interested in it. And I was kind of my lifestyle was really changing, like getting less conventional, a little more hippy dippy more alternative stuff, you know, and I kind of felt like, I just don't feel like conventional medicine is really, really the way for me, you know, and I had grew up in a household where there's a lot of folks with a lot of serious health problems. And I really saw my family kind of get worse by conventional medicine. And so I kind of had this little disillusion around it and ended up finding Bastyr University and their herbal sciences program and was like, this light bulb just went off. And I was like, that's, that's the path. That's the path for me, you know, and wanting to still wanting to heal and help people, but wanting to do it in a natural and a holistic manner. <clears throat> so for me, that was really kind of the beginning of my plant path. And um, Bastyr, of course, was this huge door opening <laughs> kind of environment to be in and being introduced to, <clears throat> you know, things like Ayurvedic medicine and Chinese medicine and Thompsonianism and eclecticism and physiomedicalism and homeopathy and all the different, you know, aspects of herbal medicine from across the world and different traditions. And, and I think for me, what I, what I really kind of my focus ended up becoming was, you know, on the one hand, <clears throat> at Bastyr, we're learning a lot about the science of spirit of herbal medicine, right? Is like their constituents and their biochemical mechanisms of action and how they influence the body on this very kind of biochemical scientific level, right? As the herbal science program. Um, but for me, you know, plants and nature and herbal medicine always just felt like a deeper part of my spiritual path. You know, for me, I always considered myself like, I guess, for lack of a better term, like a spiritual seeker, like wanting to be wanting to know who I am and why I'm here and what is this life and how can I be a better person and wanting to, you know, understand life spiritually. And for me, that really was kind of born through my time in nature. And so the plants inevitably kind of became a part of that. And as I worked with herbal medicine, I found that they were healing me in ways beyond just helping my symptoms go away. You know, it was, they were changing me as I developed relationships with plants. I kind of would emerge out the other side and with more insight into myself and understanding of, you know, why I am the way I am, how I can be better. And that was healing. And so for me, it, it kind of turned into this, well, there's the science part over here and the spiritual part over here. And there wasn't really a whole lot of connective tissue between them. And so a lot of my focus on my plant path has been striving to unite science and spirituality in, in plant medicine and having a model and approach that could really speak both languages. Because oftentimes they kind of seem to butt heads and I don't really think it has to be that way. I actually think they're quite complementary. So um, that has led me down all sorts of different avenues. Um, and I think the big ones for me was really the, the alchemical tradition and spagyric model of herbal pharmacy and <clears throat> coupled to that, the medical astrology as a, you know, a very, very profound and deep medical tradition, um, you know, in the European uh, medical system. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of a little bit of my story and how I came to herbal medicine and kind of what my uh, orientation with it all is. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Sage. I, um, we are so much on that same path, which is something I've long recognized in our work, that bridging of those different worlds and wanting those, the plant medicine and science to all be a interrelated whole that we get to present. And, and what strikes me is just um, how that can be this like large umbrella for many of us herbalists striving for that, but how we do it in such unique ways. And you mentioned spagyrics, alchemical process, um, astro herbalism. I want you to talk. I would love it if you just talk more about those just a little bit, just for folks who don't know you, because those are so um, you just do it in such a unique way that if someone's not already familiar with it, that 
think that's pretty interesting to hear about. So maybe start with spagyrics since we mentioned them already and just what are spagyrics? Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> so spagyrics is um, a branch of the alchemical tradition that specifically focuses on plant works, um, meaning it's essentially a model of herbal pharmacy um, that is focused on uh, separating and purifying and recombining what in alchemy are referred to as the three principles in plants. They're called sulfur, mercury, and salt, or the soul, the spirit, and the body of the plant. And the whole orientation of the, the alchemical tradition really as a whole is our spiritual development, right? The, the point of alchemy is to have a deeper understanding of nature, nature externally, life, the cosmos, as well as our own nature internally, and seeking union between the two. And in that way, we are become more illuminated beings, so to speak, not to sound too woo-woo about it, right? But that's kind of some of the older terminology that's used. So so alchemy is, is, is on the one hand, it is a spiritual path, but on the other hand, it is, um, it is a chemical path, right? It's a way of understanding um, nature and working with nature to craft medicine <clears throat> that is healing on all levels of being, that's healing the body, it's healing the mind, it's healing the heart, and ultimately is serving in the growth, the development, the evolution of, of the soul. What does that mean? Well, just becoming the best versions of ourself, right? Healing our past traumas. You know, we all have patterns of thinking and patterns of feeling that, you know, maybe aren't so good or aren't so healthy. And if there's things that we all struggle with as humans and um, the whole orientation of alchemical medicine is heal the whole person. And in spagyrics, we focus on healing the whole person with the whole plant. And I think that's really important concept because we all, most of us want to be holistic herbalists. And to me, to be holistic means we are addressing the whole person, right? We're not just a symptom. We're not just a disease. We're not just a body, right? We are emotional beings. We are psychological beings. We are spiritual beings. And plants too aren't just chemicals. They're also not just an energy and they're not just a, a soul or a spirit, right? They're all of it. And so the, the, the premise of spagyric pharmacy is to craft a medicine that is a, a concentrated essence of that plant, the wholeness of that plant that has the chemistry of the plant, that has the energetic properties of the plant and has the spiritual properties of the plant all contained into one. And the effects of, they're very, uh, there are a variety of different forms of spagyrics, but their effects are really quite profound um, in the way that they are very concentrated um, and the way that they are uniquely prepared. Um, yeah, they're just really quite profound uh, in the way that they they heal. And we've been, obviously, I've been using spagyrics myself, make, crafting them for, well, I guess, how long has it been? It's been close to 15 years now, I think. Um, wow, that's kind of crazy. It's not been that long. <laughs> I guess I haven't done the math in a while. But um, yeah, and so using them myself, craft, crafted hundreds of plants into spagyrics and pr primarily used them in uh, my clinical practice, as well as offering them, um, you know, to the greater herbal community through our, um, our spagyric product line. And just the feedback that we've received from people that work with spagyrics, uh, we hear some really interesting stories, you know, of mm -hmm. the struggles that people have been able to overcome, whether that's physical stuff, spiritual stuff, psychological, emotional stuff, getting over traumas, things like that. Um, it's really, really beautiful uh, to hear those stories. And, and I think, you know, I feel like this is a time where that's the kind of healing a lot of people are looking for and if they're not maybe looking for it it's like maybe they maybe it is but they don't know that's what they're looking for they they want more than just an a band-aid you know like they want 
a deeper level of healing. They want to change. They want a deeper connection to themselves. They want a deeper connection to nature. And I think just with the craziness of the times that we're in, I feel like alchemy is really kind of coming more to the forefront. A lot more people are aware of it. Um, Spagyrix is becoming a much more of, a, I guess, a household name in the herbal community. I mean, a lot more people know what they are now than when I first got into it. Um, so it is growing in popularity. And I think it's for a reason. I think it's because um, they provide a, a form of healing that's, that's really needed at this time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That was a very beautiful introduction to Spagyrix. There's so much more that could be gone into, but yeah, <laughs> that's kind, yeah. of, the, that's nice kind of the condensed intro. version. Yeah. <laughs> and how about astrology too? How do you, how are you combining mm -hmm. herbs and astrology? Yeah, so um, they say, you know, in alchemy that that uh, astrology is one of the the sister sciences to the alchemical tradition. And you know, my teacher in uh, alchemy and spagyrics, uh, a man by the name of Robert Bartlett. Um, he's an amazing, amazing human and teacher and alchemist. And, you know, he says that the, the production of a true spagyric medicine is not possible without the use of astrology. And essentially the way that the astrology kind of comes into spagyric works, and there's kind of two sides of it. There's the way we use astrology to work with the plants. And then there's the way we use the astrology to work with people, which is the branch of medical astrology which is really a whole model of anatomy and physiology and healing and that's old and very also profound and very effective. Um, <clears throat> but in the realm of plants, the way that the astrology is used is through timing. Um, when plants are harvested, when they are prepared, when the different steps in the spagyric process are undertaken like distillation or fermentation or calcination or dissolution it's all timed in accordance with the planet that um, is corresponded to that plant so a plant is said to have a relationship to a certain planetary force based on you know the properties of the plant its organ affinities its shape, its color, its texture, its growth cycle, its energetics, um, its medicinal actions, things like that. Um, so a plant corresponds to a certain planet. And then when we, we gather the plant and process the plant, when that planet is at its peak influence so that when you are preparing it, you're not only harvesting the plant, but you're harvesting that planetary power um, within it. And so this is um it's actually it's really similar to uh, and some this is kind of i think a good analogy how in chinese medicine you know they have their way of understanding the energetics of time right and the way different elements and different organ systems are kind of at their peak at certain hours of the day um, the same is true with ayurveda you know they say different times of day are governed by vata or pitta or kapha um, the seasons and a lot of folks don't think that in the Western model that we have kind of this energetic understanding of time, uh, but we do. It's just based on the sevenfold pattern <clears throat> of the planets rather than the fivefold pattern of the elements or the threefold pattern of the in Ayurveda, the doshas. So uh, it is a way of um, utilizing kind of the, the unique energy that's flowing through a certain space at a certain time. And um, and kind of harnessing that potency. So there's it's more of the esoteric aspects of it. But I have found that it actually is very physical too. You know, um, I've harvested plants at their planetary day and hour, and noticed <clears throat> that that plant harvested at that day on that hour. That's you know, if it's a bitter plant, it's like more bitter. If it's an aromatic plant, the aromatics are stronger than if I harvest it just, you know, at, you know, whatever random time at whatever random day. So that I have noticed after doing this for a really long time that um, even just tasting the raw plant after harvesting it and maybe trying it a few days later and in the middle of the day or something, it's like, oh, that's not as bitter as it was mm -hmm. when I did it at that right time. So mm -hmm. there's something to it. And, you know, a lot of people that are really 
maybe scientifically oriented or like, well, that's BS or how is that even possible? Or how can you explain that scientifically? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, I don't really know how the rational explanation of it. Um, I just followed the tradition and have noticed that it works. Um, so that's kind of the way it works with plants, with people. It's the branch of medical astrology, um, which is a huge topic, but it's basically a way of, um, I like to think of it as another tool in our toolbox for holistic assessment in the same way that we do an intake or an interview. Uh, we maybe assess the tongue, we assess the pulse. Some people do facial assessment, some people do iridology, some people do reflexology. Medical astrology is just another one of those. Um, what I like about it is that all of the archetypes in astrology, the planets, the elements, the signs, they all have physiological rulerships, organ systems, tissues, physiological processes, patterns of excess and deficiency, uh, certain diseases that they tend to generate, as well as specific kind of healing properties that they have. And also, as most people know, you know, these astrological archetypes also relate to psychological and emotional patterns, and they also relate to kind of the processes that the soul goes through in its evolutionary development. Why I like that is because the medical astrology pattern allows you to start to see the connections between those. It's not like, oh, I've got this physical problem over here and I've got this psychological and emotional thing over here and it's something totally different. And it, it unites them so that you can see, oh, this physical dynamic is directly correlated to this psychological, emotional, or spiritual dynamic. And so then you can select your remedies in a way that again, targets the wholeness of the person. So I like it because it's a very integrated model, the way we understand the plants, the way we understand the people, the way they're assessed, and then into the way the plants are prepared into a medicine. It's all kind of in one cohesive um, model. So yeah, that's just a little bit on the on the astrological side of things. I'm really getting that sense of just wholeness from you, Sija. Whatever you're doing, you're really seeking wholeness for plant medicine, for plant, for people healing, all of it. I would say that's a really good, if we had to, if I had to use one term, <laughs> I think wholeness is, uh, is a really good way to describe it because I think ultimately, I think that's we're all, what we're all looking for. We're all looking for a sense of wholeness within ourself and, and I think that's what a lot of healing is about, is, is kind of reassembling that wholeness um, within our life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautifully said. Well, I'm very excited that you chose Wild Lettuce for today. And I'm really looking yeah. forward to chatting about Wild Lettuce with you. And my excitement, I think, stems from, I think this plant is both underrated and overrated in that <laughs> I don't think a lot of people turn to wild, medicine, or wild lettuce for medicine, for healing. And it has so many virtues and gifts. But then lately in the past couple of years, you've probably seen this, like the memes that go around that say that like wild lettuce is like as good as morphine for pain relief and, you know, kind of, you know, making these wild claims about it that yeah. I don't really think hold up either, you know, but it's like every time, yeah. you know, it's a, goes viral you know you just see it shared everywhere so i'm excited i'm really excited to hear what you have to say about wild lettuce yeah well boy those folks better be careful what they say because uh, you don't want to uh, wild lettuce to start getting on the scheduled list and maybe yeah. legal you know <laughs> yeah. but uh yeah so well a little background, you know, the reason I wanted to talk about wild it's a it's a remedy that I personally work with a lot um I am a sufferer of chronic pain. Um, I have a pretty uh, pretty bad spinal cord and degenerative spine disease and um, am in a pretty significant amount of pain like a lot of the time. And so for me, the whole category of herbs in the anodyne or pain relieving, uh, nervous system, hypnotic, sedative, slash antispasmodic world or this is like a category of remedies that I, you know, personally feel pretty acquainted with and have a lot of experience with. Um, and so wild lettuce is one of those. And it's funny because like you're saying, it's one of those herbs that, you know, you read about and, you know, 
everyone says it was like one of the best herbs for pain. And, uh, you know, it kind of is talked about in some ways as a narcotic, but then a lot of people's experience of it is not like that. And a lot of people were like, eh, it's actually not very effective. And so I got really curious about this herb and I've like gone pretty, pretty deep into it. So <clears throat> I thought I'd share a little bit about it. So, so kind of the way I like to talk about plants is kind of first, before I talk about how it's used, I like to really share a little bit about kind of its core properties. So talking about wild lettuce, the main species used is Lactuca virosa. I've been using Lactuca seriola more just because that's what was kind of growing in my area, but they're pretty interchangeable. And uh, um, it is a, the taste of it is a, it's a bitter herb, right? This is just a straight, pretty pure, bitter remedy. Um, its primary affinities in the body would be for the nervous system, coupled with the, the musculoskeletal system. And um, as it being such a strong bitter, it's definitely having an influence on the liver and probably to an extent through that, the digestive system. I don't really think of it so much as like a digestive bitter, but it's so bitter, it probably stimulates digestion to a, to a certain extent, but that's not really how I use it. Um, it's like a side benefit, I guess. Um, so then main actions... Uh, being it, this is considered an anodyne herb, meaning that it is pain relieving. And that, that's such a general, like, ran, like pain relieving. What does that even mean? Like we can be in pain for a lot of different reasons. So I feel like it's really specific to add like subdivisions of what type of anodyne an herb is, right? Because for example, like turmeric could technically be anodyne. If you take enough of it, it lowers your inflammation and you're in less pain. Um, Black cohosh can be called an anodyne because it's very antispasmodic, but turmeric and black cohosh are like very different types of anodynes, right? So, <clears throat> so for me, wild lettuce is anodyne because it is a nervine hypnotic. And what that means is that it is a sedative for the nervous system and in a stronger way. Like I think of, you know, degrees of nervine. So you have like nervine hypnotics are kind of the strongest ones. And then you have nervine sedatives or nervine relaxants that are milder ones. Those are the ones that you can use throughout the day and you're not going to get groggy or sleepy from it, you know, like lemon balm or catnip or, you know, milder ones. Whereas the hypnotics are the stronger ones. If you take enough, you'll start to feel tired, like valerian and hops and things like that. So I place wild lettuce in that more of hypnotic category. Um, I also find that uh, wild lettuce is a really great antispasmodic or spasmolytic. So those are the main properties that I think of when it comes to wild lettuce. Um, and I mentioned affinities, nervous system, musculoskeletal, liver, and digestive to an extent. I also find wild lettuce has a, a pectoral affinity. Like it kind of has this relaxant quality in the, in the upper chest. Um, and in that way, I actually uh, have been using it a little bit more in uh, spasmolytic cough formulas to help relax uh, tension in the bronchioles. And it's actually really quite effective there. Um, when coupled with other expectorants with a, a, maybe a little bit more of a focus on the lungs. Um, but I have noticed it does have a bit of a pectoral affinity. Um, so, right, okay, so there's the taste, the affinities, the actions. Now, energetics, this is a cold plant for sure. Um, most plants that have such a strong, pure, bitter taste like this um, are pretty cooling, um, which is... Um, good to keep in mind. And then uh, drying um, to the moisture quality and then relaxant to the tone of the tissues. Um, so that's kind of the energetic profile. If we were to translate that into kind of Ayurvedic terminology, we would say it cools in excess of pitta. Um, we would say that it dries an excess of kapha and that it relaxes the tension of vata. Um, but for the most part, this plant can be very aggravating to Vata because it is very cold and because it is uh, drying and Vata tends to be cold and dry, but they tend to be nervous and tense too. So that's kind of the tricky thing with 
a lot of like nervine herbs like vata really benefits from nervines because they're tense but a lot of them are, are co cooling remedies so sometimes that's why formulation can be really nice so how do we use wild lettuce well i like it for pain and um i like it specifically for musculoskeletal pain in the form of tension constriction spasm and as an acute for like trauma or severe injury if someone's in like if they injure themselves severely you can give it in a way that will help to dull that pain down a little bit is it as effective of, as morphine definitely not um <laughs> i'm just going to be really straight up and honest about that um it's it's not as effective as morphine um you know wild lettuce does exude a white latex from the fresh plant that is you know like it looks like uh you know uh, a papaver somniferum exudate right the the opium poppy um when you you know uh score the pods it exudes a white latex well uh wild lettuce kind of has a white latex that looks like that but it doesn't have the level of alkaloids that opium poppy has in it like no way um but it does have compounds in that latex that are anodyne pain relieving and antispasmodic so in terms of musculoskeletal pain so like here's the thing with wild lettuce is that i've heard from a lot of people i've read a lot of stuff and a lot of people really deem this herb as ineffective so what i have found in my work with this plant is wild lettuce i don't think is really worth much of anything in a dried format um i think this plant is definitely best used fresh because you want to capture that latex while it's fresh there's something about when it is dried <clears throat> that i think uh renders it significantly less potent um, I've made preparations of it from dried material. I've made preparations of it from fresh material in the same weight to volume measurements and found the fresh to be much more effective. But here's the thing, like you have to make this herb really strong. This is, in my opinion, not a take 10 drops, take two drops, take this is like take five milliliters <laughs> of tincture. <laughs> if you really want to get an effective pain relief and and not even take five mils of like a one to five strength ratio for those of you maybe not familiar with that terminology the a tincture ratio tells you how many grams of plant material you receive per how many milliliters so of the tincture so for example a one to five if you take five milliliters of tincture you will be getting one gram of plant material it's kind of a pretty standard ratio for a, a decent amount of herbs uh, for wild lettuce i have found that a one to five is ultimately not really that effective hmm. so my whole thing has been okay how can i create like a really concentrated wild lettuce tincture like one that will actually really work and so in, <clears throat> in the alchemical tradition, there's a certain, well, it's not, it's more in the more recent uh, stages of alchemy in the last hundred years or so. There's a certain piece of equipment called a soxlet extractor. And this is just a piece of glassware and that's spelled S-O-X-H-L-E-T. I believe it was developed by a, a German chemist. And Basically what it is, is you have a flask of, of your menstruum or your alcohol. And on top of that, you put your soxlet extractor, which is basically like a, like a, a tube that you pack all of your herbs into. And then on top of that, you put a condenser. It's just a piece of glassware that's got cold water flowing through it. That basically its job is to condense a vapor back into a liquid so what you're doing is you're you're gently boiling the alcohol in the lower flask it 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 volatilizes into a steam it kind of moves up the side arm it hits the condenser and it drips back down onto your plant material and it fills that whole column up 
And once that column gets full, there's these little capillaries in there that creates a, a pressure, kind of a vacuum pressure thing that sucks all of that menstruum back down into the boiling flask and then it recirculates back up. So this is a way of kind of circulating hot alcohol through your herb over and over and over again. And um, essentially you can do that until the alcohol coming out of the um, main soxlet is running clear, um, which is indicating that essentially the plant material is spent. So what I was have been doing is, okay, I'll run that soxlet for maybe a day and then empty it out, pack more herbs in, fire it up and circulate that same tincture through it again, empty it out, put more herbs in and do that over and over and over again until I will get something close to a one-to-one -one, uh, strength extract of that tincture. So that would be for every one milliliter of tincture, you're getting approximately one gram of herb. And one mil is about 30 drops or a dropper full is roughly one mil. Um, and that's also referred to as a fluid extract. And I have found that a one-to-one -one extract of wild lettuce is a fresh wild lettuce and typically gathered right around the flowering pure, right when it's going into flower, it's the latex is running really strong there. Um, I found that makes the most effective wild lettuce tincture. Um, I actually really pretty severely injured my back again this winter. And you know, I was like, literally I was walking on a cane. I mm. couldn't put my pants on. I couldn't put on a pair of socks. Like I mm. could barely walk. It, it was really, really bad. I was in a lot of pain and I was taking, um, a five mil dose of that wild lettuce probably every three hours. Um, and typically, you know, after maybe three doses, um, I would be experiencing like pretty effective anodyne effect from that plant. So that's like, you know, 15 mils over a period of a few hours um, of a one-to-one -one tincture. So that, so I think where people maybe don't have good results with this plant, it's because their remedy is not strong enough mm -hmm. and they're not taking enough of it. And that's been my experience with this plant. Um, the thing about taking it in that dosage though, is that you will start to feel groggy for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But when you're in that much pain, that's kind of what you're going for, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you want to have maybe a little bit of detachment from the pain. Um, you want to feel relaxed. You want your muscles to relax. You want everything to kind of open up and settle down. Um, and for people in chronic pain, uh, it interrupts sleep a lot. Um, you know, every time you shift, if you get a jolt of pain, you're going to wake up. And that is going to really get in the way of the healing process. So that's also why I like making this plant quite strong um, so that um, people can get a good restful night's sleep. Wow, thank you for sharing that. It was very interesting, that very intensive medicine making to get that really strong medicine. I'm curious, have you ever used that externally or is it mainly internal that you're using that? No, that's a good question. I actually did play around with using it topically a little bit, and um, I did find it helped It helped a little bit. But what I find with the wild lettuce is I think the way it's working on the nervous system has a lot to do with that antispasmodic effect. Um, I, antispasmodics are interesting because I find some seem to work and this is just whatever my theory or way of thinking about them, but some seem to like work directly on the muscle, whereas others seem to work more on the nerves and then through their action on the nerves, the muscles relax. I mean, I'm sure they're all working on the nerves to an extent, but that's just kind of the way I think of them. And I feel like wild lettuce, it, there's, there's something that it's doing in the nervous system that is contributing to that really strong antispasmodic pain relieving property. Um, that I find internal use um, attends to that a little better, but I did find that uh, it would definitely locally relax, you know, like a twitch. Like I had a, um, every now and then my, I get this twitch, <laughs> this twitch on my left shoulder blade, you know, it'll keep me up, you know, as I feel like I got this little butterfly fluttering in my arm and mm -hmm. I put some of that on there and it, and it made that little muscle twitch go away. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I was like, oh, okay, well that definitely was working, but for, for really like severe, muscle spasm that's really painful um 
I prefer it internally, but you can definitely put it on topically as well. And the other thing I would say is that a tea of this remedy is not, um, is again, not really that effective. A, it's really tough to drink because it's super bitter. Um, and B, the, the, the latex and a lot of the constituents in this plant are, are more alcohol soluble than they are water soluble. Mm. Well, I'm excited to work more with wild lettuce after this. I also can have similar back problems where like putting on socks is not an option. So that's yes. very interesting to me. And wild lettuce grows all over my garden. So I'm pulling it constantly yeah. and uh, which I actually love it growing in the garden because my chickens love it. So oh, I pull nice. it and hand it to them and they just go crazy for it. So <laughs> but I'm ready to pull some of my own and use it myself. And for those of you who like me are not ready to jump into the Soxlet uh, extraction method. Uh, I'll share a recipe um, that I have permission to use from Seven Song, where he's using a one to two ratio with 95% alcohol and doing a double maceration. So it's not quite as strong as what you're describing, Seja, but it's also, it's getting a lot stronger than like a, a folk method of just kind of throwing some plants in a jar with some brandy is going to get you. So this is you know more measured out and getting that uh, higher strength tincture to get those better results. Yeah, and I think one thing too that I always recommend with um, with aerial parts of plants and making remedy from it is it's really good. And the way I do it is I really like to make sure to process it down as fine as possible. Um, sometimes folks will just kind of roughly snip it up with a pair of clippers, and um, that that I mean I think that's okay, but I think it's much more preferable even at home. Like if you've got a little food processor or something to run it through a food processor with an S blade or something to try to get the plant material as fine as possible. And that way you're able to get much more plant material to um, a little less alcohol and thereby having a little bit of a stronger remedy there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree when it comes to those fresh plants, there's, I, there's nothing I do fresh really anymore, especially the aerial port portions without a blender or food processor, because there's really no way to get it that, you know, that ratio otherwise. Heavier things like berries, they can work out without a blender, but yeah, those aerial portions. Definitely. Well, and the other the other preparation that I'm really curious about, <clears throat> and I've, I've been wanting to do a little more research on it, is they call, you know, in the old days, they used to call the wild lettuce latex lactarium. And I believe that was a, a particular form of medicine. And I don't know if it was like a Lloyd Brothers preparation or an eclectic specific medication, or I don't know. I, I need to do a little bit more digging, but they had a way of working with wild lettuce to create lactarium. And I don't know if they were doing it kind of the way people do with, with papaver somniferum where you're, <clears throat> where there's just scoring the plant and scraping that wild lettuce latex and just tincturing that. I mean, it sounds like an insane amount of work, but um, that's something I'm just mentioning lactarium for anyone that that a little bit more. Um, it's, there's kind of some interesting stuff on that that I personally would love to kind of figure out how to make that because that anything that really works for pain is good to know about and good to have on hand. Um, you know, especially if for those that really don't want to go the conventional route and taking NSAIDs or, you know, getting put on, you know, prescription opioids. Um, you know, I think our herbs do have capacities that are very very good but a lot of times yeah they aren't as strong as those prescriptions so what can we do to kind of find a good middle ground there you know and i think that's a a, a good good thing to know about as herbalists it really is yeah and that, that lactarium i think they they took this that white sap and they put it into a pill somehow like they were somehow making it into like this um almost like a i don't know i don't want to say a tarred substance but that's what i remember when i read about oh. it as like they make it into a pill of some kind so oh, that would be interesting. interesting now i have to go figure that out but yeah then you don't have to take super bitter uh wild lettuce tincture which for some yeah. people is like hard to get down it's especially yeah. at five mils it's like whoo <laughs> yeah, it sends a shiver down your spine <laughs> uh well cj i'd love to hear what projects that you're working on currently what do you what do you have in the works yeah, well, you know, I, uh, I've i been running my school for the last, uh, I guess it's probably been close to eight years, 10 years, something like that. 
And uh, some of the content and some of my online courses at this point is starting to feel a little bit outdated. So I'm actually mm -hmm. getting ready to reshoot some of my online courses. Um, I've got a really good buddy who's a videographer and he just helped me set up like a really cool set that looks like an old, old alchemical apothecary look, you know, and so we're getting ready to, I'm getting ready to do a lot of reshooting of some of my online courses, which I'm really excited about. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's been kind of a project. And then, and then we actually very recently just kind of reopened our Spagyric product line. Um, we, you know, we had a lab down in Southern Oregon when we lived down there and everything was cruising along. And then we up and moved back to Washington and uh, haven't really had a facility since we moved up here like three and a half years ago. And um, finally got our facility built out and are back, you know, back in action, making making our spagyrics and um, kind of ended up revamping the whole thing and changed the name and new labels. And we finally got a legit website up. And so that was like a really a lot of work, really big project, but we're, I'm really stoked to kind of have a lab again and get back into making remedies and being able to have them available for people to work with. So, um, so yeah, those have kind of been the, those have kind of been the big ones lately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Aside from it. aside from having a toddler, you know, that's it's not project, <laughs> but sometimes it feels like it, you know. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> well, the last question I have for you, Sage, is a question I'm asking everybody in season five, and that is what's one way that you feel like herbalism is misunderstood by the general public? Like one way that annoys you, let's be honest. <laughs> like or just, you know, the one that you wish could change something along those yeah. lines. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a really good question. I mean, I think there's a handful of ways that herbal medicine is probably misunderstood by the general public, but you know, I mean, and there's, there's spectrums of the general public. There's like the general public that just thinks herbal medicine is complete bullshit. <laughs> and then on the other side, there's the general public that's like, Oh yeah, herbs. That's like homeopathy. Right. You know? Um, <laughs> but I think, I think one of the things that to maybe speak to the folk that are at least open to the idea of herbal medicine. I, I think one of the biggest misunderstandings is that herbal medicine is really, it's just like a natural alternative to, to over the counter prescription medication. And I, what, I guess what I mean by that is that they're oftentimes thought of with the same kind of thinking as allopathic medications. And, you know, which is, oh, I have a headache, so I take an aspirin, but I'm going to be an herbalist, so I'll just take willow bark instead. Or, oh, I have inflammation, so rather than taking the ibuprofen, I'll take the turmeric instead. And it's kind of this, like, one-to-one, -one, like, replacement, and it's the whole, and we've talked about this a lot, is the use this herb for that symptom mindset. And it just, it just doesn't work. And it's one of the biggest things where... <clears throat> folks are like, oh yeah, herbal medicine. Well, I tried, you know, yeah, I tried willow bark for a headache and that didn't do anything, you know? And it's like, well, you know, in herbal medicine, a headache's not just a headache. There's like, how, whatever, how many different kinds of, there's hot headaches and tension headaches and cold headaches and, you know, headaches due to all kinds of different things going on in the body. And so with herbal medicine, we, we, we look at things through a really different lens than allopathic medicine does. And we don't just look at the symptom and we don't just, we try to look at the whole person and, and the plants in order to use a medicinal plant effectively, we have to know it beyond what it's good for. That's my belief. At least I don't think for people that want to be an herbalist, I believe that if you want to be working with medicinal plants, you want to help other people with medicinal plants, your knowledge and understanding of that plant has to go beyond just the symptoms it treats. You have to understand how that plant is working inside of the body um, on as many levels as possible um, because there's a lot of nuances to herbal medicine. I mean, a, a, a plant is significantly more complicated than a drug a drug's one thing right it's one mm -hmm. compound look at yarrow like how many constituents are in yarrow i don't even know like hundreds maybe thousands i don't know 
but it's a lot. And there isn't really any way that we can understand how yarrow works just based on its chemistry. We have to look at it through a different lens. And, and so I think that's kind of one of my biggest things with herbal medicine is that we can't apply the allopathic way of thinking to herbal medicine. It just doesn't work. And that's where I feel like, you know, the more modern, I guess, biomedical model of herbalism, it's it's good. It's interesting. Like, it's great to know about plant chemistry and their pharmacological mechanisms of action and what they're doing in the body. But we can't, and I remember Paul Bergner said it, he said, if you, if you try to, and I'm not going to quote him perfectly on this, but essentially what he said is if, if you try to be a clinical herbalist just using like plant constituents and the biomedical biochemical model, it's going to cripple you as a clinician. Um, you can't really do it. You have to, we have to look at and understand them through different lenses. And I think that's where our rich herbal traditions come into play of looking at their actions and looking at their energetics and looking at the way they influence the body before we really even knew anything about sesquiterpene lactones and alkaloids and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what I got to share on that. Oh, thank you, Sage. That's a powerful ending to a whole conversation that was full of so much wisdom. I deeply appreciate you taking the time to be with us and share so much. Oh, thank, thank you, Rosalie. You. It's a real honor to be on your show. And I just really appreciate you a lot and everything that you're doing to mm -hmm. uh, make a good impact on people walking this plant path. I always think of you as just a really good ally and a just a good one. So it's a real pleasure to have a chance to share and chat with you. It's been nice. It's been nice to chat with you today. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Sanja. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to a detailed handout on how to make a really strong wild lettuce tincture. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. You can also find Sanja at evolutionaryherbalism.com naturasophiaspagyrics.com. If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview and this lovely plant. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.